Sahara TV, Everything Africa, you're welcome back. Still on Nigeria Decides 2015, and as usual, we have invited informed opinion on a myriad of aspects on this all-important undertaking. On the line right now, graciously making time off his busy schedule to help us understand more about Nigeria and its elections from the outside, looking within with an expert eye, is Professor George Aite. Professor Aite is a distinguished economist and a former professor at the American University, Washington, D.C. He's also an author and the president of Free Africa Foundation, based in Washington, D.C. Professor Aite is probably most known for his inspiring speech on the TED series. You're welcome to Sarah TV, Professor Aite. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, thank you very much, sir. In a few weeks, Nigerians will head for the polls. Uh, after a, a postponement, which many um, see or many regard as dubious, what lies uh, in store for, the, for Africa's most populous nation? Is that postponement going to affect Atairu Jeges' uh, credibility and if, indeed that of the INEC? Well, the, um, the polls are Government claims that, you know, because of the security situation in the Northeast and battling Boko Haram, that necessitated the postponement of the election. But it may, that may well be, but I think it arouses a lot of suspicion and speculation. Mm. One being that um, perhaps, you know, Jonathan was afraid of the election and he was not prepared and he felt that he might lose. Some people might argue that, you know, perhaps they wanted to uh, rig the elections and they hadn't put all the uh, machinery in place. Mm. You know, it, it, that kind of speculation is not very healthy for uh, Nigeria. And in particular, also, it's not very healthy for the rest of Africa because South Sudan is also going to have elections. They have also postponed their elections. Mm. And uh, there are other African countries like Ethiopia, they're going to have elections in May. So we don't want to set a precedent and uh, allow African countries to postpone elections at will. Mm. Because that would be a huge setback for the democratic struggle in Africa. Okay. So, um, so the two top horses, if you will, in the race are incumbent, um, good luck, Jonathan, and... Um, General Mohamed Buhari. Now, um, good luck, Jonathan. Is campaigning on the on the bluff of uh, spearheading Nigeria to the status of Africa's biggest economy and others like that. Buhari also has his own issues that he's campaigning on. First of all, let's talk about good luck, Jonathan. Does he have any business seeking re-election? Well, you know. I am uh, sort of troubled by his uh, quest for uh, another term because, look, he uh, finished off the term for uh, the late president, Yadua, okay, who passed away in 2010. Mm -hmm. So by finishing off uh, his tenure, that should have counted as, you know, one term. And then he ran in, you know, 2011. That should have counted as the second term. So it, I personally, you know, this is my own personal view. I don't think he should have gone for elections this year. Mm. And um, and by pushing for them, I think that that is what led to uh, the formation of the uh, uh, all progressive, you know, Congress. You know, for them to uh, mobilize the opposition to oppose him. And this is one of the reasons why many of the northern delegates, you know, simply broke away from the PDP to form their own party. Mm. So in a way, you know, his quest for, literally, it was, it, it, his quest for a third term is what has sort of uh, broke up, you know, the uh, PDP party. Mm. So let's, let's explore that a little bit further. In the past, you have had quite uncomplimentary words to describe good luck Jonathan. Has he matured since you last stopped short of describing him as... Um, Clueless, let's be charitable. Well, you know, uh, I have been, you know, very disappointed in him uh, in the sense that, you know, look, you don't have to look very far. Um, look at the uh, 
power situation, electricity situation. Right now, only 30% of Nigerians have access to, you know, reliable electricity. Hmm. Look at the water situation. You know, you say that, we can say that 46% of Nigerians, only 46% of Nigerians have access to uh, clean water. Then talk about sanitation, talk about, you know, health care. I don't think Jonathan has done anything up at all to curb corruption. You know, a year ago, you may remember, you know, the former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, you know, Lamidu Sanusi. Yeah. You know, raised the alarm that, look, $20 billion in oil revenue has not been uh, sort of uh, channeled to the government corpus. And when he raised the revenue, it was he, the governor, who was sacked. Mm. And uh, still, they still haven't been able to find a $20 billion in oil revenue, which is missing. They said, you know, they set up this forensic audit and found that only uh, $1.48 billion was owed to the government. And then he has been under, you know, a lot of pressure to release the forensic uh, report, but he's refusing to release it. So, you know, the thing is, you know, in my view, well, you know, I was hoping that he would be able to shape up, but he hasn't. But that does not necessarily mean that I am for Buhari, because um, the choice uh, the choice for Nigeria, in my view, is not very good. Because if you look at since Nigeria's independence in 1960, the military rulers have really dominated the political scene. Yeah. In, in, uh, in 1999, when they wanted to hand over power to the civilian, it was... You know, Obasanjo, who you know became president, Obasanjo is a retired military general. Mm. So, all right, you know, the hand is over to Yadwa and then uh, to uh, Jonathan. But now you have another retired military general coming back into the political scheme. That's something which worries me. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, it's as if Nigerians are saying that, apart from the military, you cannot, you know, pull any uh, leader from anywhere else, and that is something which I reject. It's it's interesting that you mentioned this, because uh, I was actually going to move on to uh, General Buhari and ask you similar questions that I've asked about Good Luck Jonathan. He also has human rights issues. He has um, allegations of religious chauvinism hanging around his neck like an albatross. Is this a case of the devil and the deep blue sea? Nigerians don't have any better choice? Is Is it? Doom for Nigeria? Well, yeah, this is why I'm somewhat, you know, very disturbed, you know. And I think, you know, Nigerians really needed a clean slate, you know, of candidates, you know, to take the country forward. I mean, if you look at, at the current candidates, you know, they have had their chances. They have, they have, you know, issues with many others, you know, with corruption, with human rights violations and so forth. So, uh, you know, it's uh, you know when you look at it, it's it's not a, a choice which I, I personally will find palatable, and mm. it, it puts Nigerians in a you know a very hard place. They find themselves in you know caught between a rock and a you know a hard place. In a hard place, indeed. So, on on still on on General Buhari, and in fact, let's move from General Buhari for a second and and look at the governors and and all all of that. A lot of the time, the blame gets put on the, on the president. But looking down, there's a whole uh, pantheon of, of political operatives. However, we also look at these people, and then I'll, I'll borrow a quote from you and see if this description fits this class of people that I'm talking about. You've described um, some African politicians as the hippo generation, and you, you describe them as um, uh, an assortment of military fufu heads, Swiss bank socialists, crocodile liberators, vampire elites, quack revolutionaries. Is that what we're dealing with in Nigeria right now? <coughs> well, <coughs> well, the kind of leadership that we've had in Africa, I'm sorry to say, you know, has been, you know, abysmal. And, um, the worst type of leadership that we've had in Africa has, have come from the military. If you look across Africa, you know, the military has been uh, the bane of Africa's development. 
look at all the failed states that we have in uh, Africa. <coughs> Somalia was destroyed in 1991 by General Yadbari. Liberia destroyed by General Samuel Do. Rwanda destroyed by General Yuvenal Habeyamana. Mm. Zaire was destroyed by General Mobutu Sisi Seiko. Sierra Leone. You know, I can go on and on and on and on. Yeah. In Nigeria, by a full stream of general. So, you know, for Nigerians to go back and pick a retired general is something which really worries me. Mm. Okay. All right. So now, Jara Buhari was invited to London a, a, a short while ago, apparently not too long ago, uh, by the Chatham House, where he delivered a speech. There was uh, some kind of a protest outside the building. And from a certain blogger's point of view, he thinks that uh, these people who were protesting were actually rented by the PDP. He says in his, t in his tweet that the very people who need salvation are the ones who are fighting against the salvation. Is this uh, uh, an apt description of what's going on? Yeah, well, you know, I wouldn't put that past the PDP because, as a matter of fact, you know, if you read the Nigerian papers, there was one particular, you know, military officer who claimed that, you know, the gubernatorial elections in uh, Ekiti State Ekiti was, you know, yeah, was, you know, was rigged. And uh, uh, the PDP employed, you know, the services of the military to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all kinds of shenanigans going on. And um, so I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't put it past the PDP to do something which uh, Buhari, uh, you know, uh, sort of complained about. Mm. And, uh, you know, we have to give uh, Buhari high minds for when he was in power in 1983, he did quite a lot to clamp down on corruption. You know, so that's why I think that's why a lot of Nigerians are looking up to him, uh, you know, to fight corruption. Mm. But I think it would be a mistake for Nigerians to look upon one particular leader to fight corruption. You fight corruption with institutions. By institutions, I mean the Auditor General, the Accountant General, you know. Yeah. And uh, attorney general, they are those who should be in the forefront of fighting corruption. The, uh, and then, the, you know, the House of Representatives, as well as the judiciary. But look, if your judges are corrupt, you know, there's no way you're going to be able to fight corruption. That's right. And uh, if the uh, attorney general doesn't prosecute the corrupt, there's no way you're going to fight corruption. You ask yourself, you know, since uh, to 2010 to today, how many of the fat cats or the bandits have the attorney general prosecuted, you know, brought to court, prosecuted, and killed? You know, if you can't name me one bandit they have done so, then you're not going to win me. It. it wouldn't matter whether Buhari is there or not. Mm. All right. Um, Professor, let's move this forward. But still on Chat Chatham House, though, they seem to have endorsed Buhari with, with this invitation at this critical point in time. F my question to you about that is, does Africa need institutions like Chatham House to endorse our leaders for us? Also against the backdrop that the Mo Ibrahim um, Prize for Exemplary uh, African Leadership has failed to come up with any winners for the past few years. What does that say well, about, about the future for Africans? Well, this is, this is a problem. It's not only Chatham, uh, Chatham House, but also the Economist magazine mm. also came out with uh, sort of literally endorsed Buhari. Says that, well, it was doing so reluctantly, sort of little, little like uh, it was, you know, uh, pinching its nose to uh, uh, endorse Buhari. See, this is what this is what you know. The foreign is it athletes look at the Nigerian situation that uh, they regard you know uh, Jonathan to have been a failure, and so they feel that you know if you're giving uh, two bad choices, Buhari uh, Buhari will be a better choice than Jonathan. Mm. 
And I think that's their reasoning. Do we need these institutions, though, Professor? Do we really need, do we have to wait for Chatham House to endorse a candidate in order for us to put our confidence in him or her? But, you know, we don't really need them. You know, it's Nigerians who have to make up their own minds. It's Nigerians who have to determine who is best to uh, rule them. You know, outsiders, you know, can make whatever decisions that they want. But it's Nigerians who ultimately have to make that okay. choice. All right, sir. So uh, two more questions, and we will let you go and continue your busy day, sir. Um, Boko Haram is perhaps Nigeria's biggest problem right now. That's if we look past corruption and a few other ills. Um, Buhari, being a retired general, has promised to deal with that issue decisively, and most Nigerians believe that he has the capacity to do that, whereas they, they think that um, Kulak Jonathan lacks the appetite to do so. What is the, the situation here? And first of all, I mean, also, um, does anybody hold the aces to fighting Boko Haram? Is it dependent on what kind of leader we have, or is it a bigger problem that we have to look at? Well, first of all, let me uh, uh, say this. You can only solve a problem if you understand how the problem, you know, originated, okay? Mm. It's not, you know, just because uh, General Buhari came from the military doesn't mean that you can use a military might uh, to defeat, you know, Boko Haram. If you look at post-colonial Africa, no African government has been able to put down a rebel insurgency. No African government has been able to do that. The only example that we can give is uh, in 1967 in Biafra. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that, that wasn't a rebel insurgency. It was a secessionist bid. Mm. The Biafrans wanted to break away. And the Nigerian, you know, military, you know, quenched that, you know, particular attempt. But Boko Haram is an insurgency. And one has to understand how that insurgency came about. There are two factors. The first one was that you know, if you look at the northern part, it's been economically devastated. If you go to Kano, for example, Kano used to be uh, one of the largest textile industries in West Africa. But with the importation of cheap Chinese textiles, literally the textile mills in Kano were, were literally destroyed. And that threw a lot of people out of jobs. And the youth couldn't find any jobs in Kano. So it became economically devastated. Now, the second factor is much more political. Now, you may remember that, you know, before the military handed over to uh, the Union rule in 1999, there was some kind of a gentleman agreement between the Northern Power Brokers, okay, mm -hmm. and the South. And they decided that, okay, they were going to rotate the presidency between the north and the south. Mm. There was also another line to that particular agreement, an understanding that whoever became president from the south would not go after the military bandits who came from the north, like uh, Babangida and uh, Abacha and so forth. But when Obasanjo became president in 1999, uh, the Northern Power Brokers felt that Obasanjo had betrayed them because Obasanjo was going after uh, Abacha. The loot that Abacha hoarded, $5 billion in loot, and also uh, tried to haul Babangida, you know, before the Oputa Commission, which Babangida refused to appear before. So there was this kind of animosity with the uh, Northern Power Brokers. And you may remember that in October of 2002, the governor of Zafara decided to break away and sort of uh, poke Obasanjo in the eye and declared the Sharia to be the, uh, the state religion of Zafara, mm. even though that was in contravention of Nigeria's constitution. Check Nigeria's constitution, chapter one, Part 2, Section 10, it forbids the establishment of a state religion. 
But Damfara, you know, went ahead and declared the, uh, the Sharia as a state religion. And when that happened, about 12 northern states also followed suit. So to me, this sort of created an environment or the groundwork for Boko Haram, you know, to, uh, to emerge and mm. to rise. Because, you know, Boko Haram, you know, said about, okay, look, the northern states have declared themselves to be, you know, Islamic states and sh the Sharia Islamic religion. And I think Boko Haram noticed that those governors who are declared the Sharia to be their state religion, they themselves, they were not practicing true Islam. And I believe that is what led to the rise of Boko Haram. Interesting analysis. Very, very interesting analysis. Um, finally, Prof, um, we... Let me read a quote from General Buhari at the Chatham House event and then ask your opinion on it. The general said, I cannot change the past, but I can change the present and the future. So before you is a former military ruler who has converted, sorry, before you is a former military ruler and a converted Democrat who is ready to operate under the democratic norms and is subjecting himself to the rigors of democratic election for the fourth time. Are you impressed, Professor? Oh, not really, because, you know, uh, we've had so many Af African leaders in HLC who have made promises, they never kept their promises. You know, look at Abacha. And, uh, you know, Abacha held a constitutional conference, you know, with the, this was way back in 1995. Now the constitutional conference said, so I'm going to return Nigeria to civilian rule. And uh, he allowed only five parties to be registered. And guess what happened? When he allowed five parties to be registered, all the five parties immediately chose him as the presidential candidate. What kind of thing is this? <laughs> so, you know, you're talking about a situation where the people no longer believe what the uh, candidates tell them, mm. you know. So this is the problem with Buhari and, you know, the others. Um, uh, remember, you may remember Jonathan also said that well, back in uh, when he was running for president in 2011, he promised that you know by 2014 there will be you know electricity to all Nigerians. What happened? <laughs> mm, I see. I said finally, but let me, if you will indulge me for just one more very short question. Sure. Does Buhari's age matter at all? We hear a lot of talk about him being not well, him being too old. Is this anything that should impede a political aspirant at all? Well, you know, again, it is up to the Nigerian people to uh, decide. But if you ask for my personal opinion, I personally would think that, you know, Buhari, you know, he, he has a strong point in, in his campaign, in a purported campaign against corruption. But whether he will be able to inspire the youth, you know, it's a totally different matter. And I think, you know, the youth are simply tired of, you know, the military and the way the military has intervened in Nigerian politics and have, have made a complete mess of it. Now, if you look at Nigeria right now, Nigeria ought to be, you know, the giant of Africa. Mm. You know, a shining example for the rest of Africa to follow. Now, we used to call, back, back in the 1960s, we used to call Nigeria the giant of Africa. Yeah. But if you look at Nigeria today, you know, it's like a, a pathetic comatose midget. You know, and whose fault is this? You know, the fault of, you know, the deprecation of Nigeria rests with the military, military rulers. Look, between, 2000, between 1960 and 2004, more than $450 billion in oil revenue flowed into Nigeria's government coffers. What happened to that oil revenue? You know, the uh, Economic and Financial Crimes Commission set up under the chairmanship of uh, Malam, you know, Nuhu Ribadu, mm -hmm. claimed that of that $450 billion, 
$412 billion of that was stolen by Nigeria, you know, military rulers. You know, so uh, when somebody comes and says that, well, look, I am somebody from the, uh, with the military background and I'm coming to clean up Nigeria, you know, a lot of Nigerians would dismiss that as a crude oil joke. Hmm. Thank you so much, Professor George Aite, distinguished economist. It's interesting to to also note that um, in a, in, a, in an interview with Professor Aris Campbell, he made a similar point that you've been making all along about the cheetah generation, what you call the cheetah generation, rising up to sort of push aside the hippo generation and make Africa a better place. Thank you for your time and your insights, and we hope to speak with you again soon. Thank you so much. I'm sorry my, my voice is not very clear because I have a cold. You sound really great, Professor. You are very audible. Thanks. And everything you said has been well noted. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you very much. Keep watching. This is Sahara TV. There's more coming. Thank you. Uh, hello. Hello, Prof.